deep conversations with Uli Bear on big ideas and great books. Welcome to Think About It or welcome back. Thank you for listening in this really difficult time. And first of all, my heart goes out to everybody who has someone who is sick or not feeling well. And I do know this is an incredibly difficult time for most people. So I hope the podcast can provide you an hour or so with material to think about something else. Today, the choice of the books that I talk about is motivated by the consideration that they add something new and different to the world. Today's book is by Daniel Defoe, written in 1722, nearly 300 years ago, and it's called A Journal of the Plague Year, about the plague that decimated London's population in 1665. At that time, Defoe was five years old, so he lived through only very little of it and was actually taken out of the city to the country. But the narrative is both gripping and suspenseful and also filled with data. My question about that book was to Jenny Davidson, a professor at Columbia University, one of the great readers of novels and expert herself on Defoe and other books and the author of several studies of Jane Austen, of 19th and 18th centuries ideas of breeding and of the ideas of manners in literature. I spoke with Jenny not just about Defoe and why read a book about the plague during a pandemic, but why read in general? What does it do for us to read books? How does it create time and allow us to immerse ourselves in an activity that is both removed from the world we're in and also somehow allows us to cope with it? I'm really delighted, Jenny, to have you on the show today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. So my guest is Jenny Davidson, who is a literary scholar, novelist, um, professor at Columbia University. Uh, we actually have known each other for a very long time. Um, we went to college and graduate school together. And um, I just wanted to point out you are a novelist. You've written four novels, uh, Heredity, The Explosionist, Invisible Things and The Magic Circle. And then you've written several scholarly books on fiction, on novels, on literature, um, hypocrisy and the politics of um, polite politeness, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Another book on breeding, on the distinction between nature and culture, let's say in the 18th century, whether we are made what we are or whether we are born to be what we are. A book called Reading Style and a book called Reading Jane Austen. So... You are in self-quarantine, as am I right now in Colombia. We are probably 120 blocks apart right now. That, that sounds about right. And you also are a super athlete, right? You are a triathlete. You've done ultra marathons. So how does it feel, first of all, for you to be in-house? You're, you're well, I hope, and you're just staying indoors right now. I'm very well. I'm staying mostly indoors, although I have to say I've been thinking for several weeks now about the question of what would happen if and when I was no longer able to run outside. Uh, running, I find absolutely essential for mental health and mood. So I was relieved when I first read the Bay Area lockdown restrictions last week that when you look closely under essential activities, outdoor exercise is included as one of the things where you can le legitimately go outdoors. So I have still been running outside with the simple precaution of wearing, they're called, it's called a buff. It's like a, it's what you would wear in very cold weather that covers up your nose and mouth. Really? And also a pair of running gloves. Uh, really the, 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 the key thing I think in terms of safety as well as staying in a good distance from other people, which as you know, is difficult to do in New York. I you know, uh, the key, the key thing I think is really making sure that you're not going to be touching your face. And for me, having gloves on in particular, and to a lesser extent, face covering is my tool for doing that. Right. So, so you've taken some measures and the, why, why I have you on the show today, I'm so excited is to talk about Daniel Defoe, uh, one of your authors, and, yes, indeed. Um, the book uh, that has become a journal of the plague year 1722, written almost 300 years ago, that has become so terribly relevant right now, right? And you've been reading this book and teaching this book for a long time, long before this um, COVID-19 crisis has hit the globe, right? Absolutely. 
So tell me a little bit about Defoe as a person, because we want to get into why read this book right now. I've been reading it now for the last three weeks. It's a book that doesn't cheer you up, but I'm kind of interested. Why would we turn to a book of a plague memoir right now? What does it do for us? But first, who is Daniel Defoe? Um, obviously one of the great um, sort of people in the history of literature in general. It's certainly a hugely influential figure in the history of literature. His write, the shape of his writing career is actually quite unorthodox in the sense that the books that he's really best known for now, written, published in the 1720s for the most part, uh, 1710s, 1720s, uh, he was in his late 50s by the time that he started writing what we categorize as fiction. So he had had an interesting career with many ups and downs. He was a failed businessman who declared bankruptcy. He was involved with one of the rebellions against Stuart rule. He was strongly allied with the dissenting uh, folks, which is to say people who were not a part of the established religion in England, often, uh, as in Defoe's case, part of a merchant class and so forth. So he also worked as a spy for the government. So he had a wildly varied career. And in the first stage of his writing and publishing life, he was really writing all sorts of topical pamphlets, uh, perhaps most famously, the satire, A Shortest Way with the Dissenters, that was meant to be a parody of government crackdowns on uh, on on unorthodox forms of religion, but actually was read by many as if it were just a serious, albeit rather extreme, uh, statement of the actual government position. Uh, but lots of different, uh, lots of different pamphlets. He was somebody who had the widest possible interests. I think of him as having an economist's or a sociologist's interest, interest in trade, in monetary policy, in the ways of uh, tracking and thinking about the world that we would associate with the emerging social sciences. So that's the first part of Defoe's career. And as he moves into the period where he's writing these very influential books that are still widely read, Robinson Crusoe has perhaps been the most influential, but uh, Journal of the Plague Year, Moll Flanders, Roxana, Captain Singleton, these are still novels that we read very regularly in, for instance, 18th century fiction classes. As he moved into that period of his writing, he forged a new path in certain respects. Uh, the novel is only emerging as a genre in that period. Uh, there are prose romances that can find models from much, much earlier times as well. We can see uh, moving into prose rather than poetry and so forth in the later 17th century. But a lot of these stories that are written for uh, entertainment are written in highly stylized worlds that bear very little resemblance to the lived reality of the people who are reading them. Princesses have ornate names or their shepherdesses singing songs with their sheep in stylized, you know, 16th century France and so forth. So Defoe's idea of what this new kind of writing would be incorporated many of the elements that he developed in his so to speak, non-fictional writing, uh, travel writing, analytic writing around various phenomena, art, uh, various kinds of moral argument and so forth. He incorporated those techniques into something that is usually structured, uh, certainly in the case of novels like Robinson Crusoe uh, and Moll Flanders, as the story of an individual person's life. And so what he's inventing is what we take completely for granted, that the novel is the story of an individual who undergoes all sorts of trials and tribulations, maybe triumphs, defeats, and has a world that he or she maps with incredible detail and this kind of eye to both what's immediately around him or her, and then the larger world and connections, which is both for Crusoe, which is a book of a man stranded on an island who builds his own world, and then the plague year, which is a man who sees his world disappear and fall apart in front of his eyes. So that's really new. And today, when we say the novel, we all know what that means. It's a book about someone's life, and there can be many characters or very few characters, and it's in a believable world that we can inhabit with that person. I might just add, all of what you've said is exactly right, but I might just add that 
we don't imagine that the original readers of these books understood them to have been what I might colloquially call made up stories, right. <laughs> which is to say uh, in, 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 all of, in all of these narratives, Defoe drew very heavily on uh, real life published narratives and interviews that he did. Mal Flanders probably was a real woman who Defoe spoke to at really? the gate prison and did interviews with. Uh, you probably know that one of the sources for Crusoe was the narrative of Captain Alexander Selkirk, who really had been shipwrecked on a desert island and right. Defoe borrowed a lot of those details. That's relevant for Journal of the Plague Year as well, because in the case of this particular book, it purports to be in every way a true journal by somebody who lived through this historical episode, a man who's not given a full name but has the initials HF. So the presentation of the book on the title page is is not to say this is a novel by Daniel Defoe written to entertain you. It is um, presenting itself as a, as a true narrative, a personal narrative and a true history that may potentially be of some utility to readers who were actually experiencing, it was clearly one of the prompts for Defoe throwing this thing together and getting it into print, were actually experiencing uh, a wave of the plague that had come to England in that year. So the book presents itself as an autobiography or a survivor's account, a kind of first-hand yes. account. He was five years old when the plague actually exactly. returned to London in the in 1660s. So he couldn't have lived through this. So he's basing it I, on... Yes. I usually make sure to emphasize that when I'm first introducing the book to my students when I'm teaching it, because I think you probably agree with me, there is an uncanny immediacy, and it's very easy to imagine that this really is the writer's true first-person account. So uh, from this distance, the, the so to speak, 60-year age difference doesn't seem like a big deal, right. but of course, really, it's impossible that this should have been Defoe's own personal memories. So we, with the benefit of hindsight, we read it today as a novel, and you said he kind of invents a genre. So at that moment, people don't even quite classify things in this way, but he actually gives the book to the public and say, this is a true account. So he, it, We also could think of it, a book that is rather less read, although it is available in a Penguin paperback edition and it is taught sometimes, is a book he wrote some years earlier called The Storm, yeah. uh, which was an account of this devastating storm that destroyed things all over England. He pulled in a la sort of uh, social science reporting accounts and published information from all over. So you can think of th that book really doesn't have a main character who has a personal subjectivity and, you know, who <laughs> makes you feel like you're reading a, a, a personal account. But you can think of Journal of the Plague Year as sort of poised between, on the one hand, the kind of narrative, journalistic, proto-social scientific reporting of a clearly non-fiction book such as The Storm. And on the other hand, these narratives, including Roxana and Mal Flanders and Crusoe, that have an air of verisimilitude and drew on real life sources, uh, while also being quite clearly uh, in the category that we would now call fiction. <laughs> And the book starts out when you start reading it. Um, I mean, I read it now a couple of times over the last couple of weeks. I think I read it the first time four weeks ago. And in some ways, I feel like I'm living through the same thing that he is dating himself every day. So the book starts out by saying, we heard that there was a case of the plague in this particular parish in London, and it probably came from Holland. We later on learned it was probably from a package of silk or some kind of garments. It was unpacked and it was hidden in that. And then he said, and then it debated, and then there wasn't really another case till February, and then there was two or three cases, and then there was no cases till April. And then we slowly are drawn into this narrative, which then accelerates more and more. Mm -hmm. And to me, honestly, it felt like the last eight weeks in America, where actually we got information from Wuhan in January, and everybody thought, well, that's very far away for most of us, and mm -hmm. some people traveled to China, and then it went to Korea, and they were like, that's very far away, and there's the cruise ship in Japan, and that's very far away. And then things calm down. And the, the story in the book begins in the same way, that people will continue their daily lives with these bits of knowledge that he puts in, which then assume this incredible significance when the, the narrative kind of picks up. 
It's brilliantly well done as a matter of technique. I think the the um, the pacing feels very natural. You know, it 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 resembles closely. You know, the way that newspapers put bits of information out and you note them without really letting them sink in deeply and so forth. But it effectively produces a sort of a feeling of suspense and a, 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 a you know a, a build up of tension that then uh, is. It, it is much more fully developed once the illness starts to grow more intense locally. Right. The situation and, we're now in. <laughs> and then he makes a decision in which is kind of, I think this is why it's, and I want to talk about in a bit why we read literature at all, because you said he meant this to be a bit of an instruction manual for the people of London in the 1720s who had maybe another bout of the pandemic coming on. So they wanted to learn what people should do. His yes. first big decision is should he leave the town. He's well off. He's he has enough money that, and he sees a trek of people leaving the city, of horse carts and people and everybody who has money trying to get out at that moment into the countryside. And he makes a decision not to leave. Yeah. And we certainly are not made to feel that he has superior insight. It's it it's a it's a case of everybody uh, being forced to make decisions very quickly uh, under a lot of pressure, and even quite incidental factors can sway you one way or the other. Uh, y- you also can see then to the way that you know the time will pass when you still are in a position to make any kind of a decision. He, he's quite good on the, there's this flurry and there's a lot of movement that itself actually is likely to be already spreading disease. Uh, and then there comes a time where it will become much, much more difficult to travel because of uh, various kinds of constraint. Can you say something again about what you just said that time still passes and he still thinks he can make decisions in time where in reality, the narrative is already kind of suggesting Time is out of his control. There are things that are happening under the surface, invisible. So this is a really powerful effect of the novel that you're reading it, but you know he's still deliberating. Should I leave? Should I not leave? My servant betrayed me. He absconded. He left me. I can't get out anymore. I would have to there's, walk. There's a, there's a concern for the narrator, as for many of his fellows in the city of London, about leaving property unattended, about what will happen to business and so forth if you, the main proprietor, leave. And these kinds of um, daily concerns are hugely on the minds of the Londoners in the book and often will prompt, uh, there's a clear sense that that Defoe expresses that that momentary need or anxiety about what will happen to one's property when one leaves it unattended is actually itself a kind of diagnostic stage that a time will then soon come when property seems to be the least of everybody's worries. Yeah, that's really interesting. So there's a kind of, and then he starts kind of focusing in and it's, it, he moves through this town as if it's the plague and he gives the plague this incredibly palpable dimension. It's like a character. It's stalking the city. It is raging with intensity. It goes from one parish to the next and people in one parish over think, well, it's over there. Exactly. There's all these mortality bills. We know lots of people have died. We probably think they're not quite disclosing all the real causes of death, but we're going to be okay. So let me say a little bit more about one thing that you just mentioned, which is the bills of mortality. This is one of my absolute favorite technical aspects of this particular novel. So the bills of mortality uh, were a form of recording, sort of civic recording, that was first developed in the 17th century in London, and that essentially involved individual parishes in the city putting together a list each week or each fortnight of all of the deaths in the parish and when it was possible to say what the cause of death was in each case. So this is a really wonderful early example of a government taking public health measures with I think I could safely say all public health members uh, measures depend on having quality information. (laughs) So the system that London had uh, before the 1660s was this, these bills of mortality and they were, they were printed and you could get hold of a copy of them. They were pasted up locally on, on a, on a board and so forth. So one of the, one of the things that makes Defoe such an original and imaginative novelist is that he realized he could actually not just describe those documents, but incorporate those documents into his novel as one of the tools that he uses to 
to depict the trajectory of the illness. And then, of course, again, its decline later on. And I think there's an interesting dependency today on data and science, and we all want numbers all the time. We have these trackers. We want to know the cases, who's been tested, et cetera. And then Defoe says, well, but then people actually were very reluctant to disclose that they had a family member die of the plague because they were afraid of what he calls this shutting up of houses, which we would call quarantine. He was very, he said, everybody had a great fear. He said, people were extremely terrified at the thoughts of it. So they yes. didn't tell the the officials if they could avoid it. If someone died of the plague, they said they died of other things. So data is this huge thing. Sudden, it seems as you're saying, yeah. pretty sudden, pretty new. Very important for the public officials to make decisions. But human beings don't want to necessarily surrender the right data because it'll impact their families in devastating ways. Absolutely. And so he, so the narrator, again, he, he doesn't put it obviously in these words. He's very clear that individual people's or families' interests is at odds with the needs of public right. health. Right. And it's one of the third things. Let me say one other uh, thing about information and the way that he treats it in that first stretch of the novel. One of the other details that I think is really fantastic in this book Uh, is that we see H.F., the narrator, being somebody who does have a much higher ability to filter information and sort it effectively, uh, sort the real news from the fake news than many of his peers. So he doesn't present himself as a paragon. He shows us that even he is kind of temporarily attracted to the the cures that the, that the doctors are offering on the corners and so forth, right? So he's, he's skeptical, but not absolutely immune to this kind of language. But the, the moment that I love so much comes when as he starts to reflect in a kind of meta mode on the, the, the stories that are going about town, the rumors, and how it is that one as a kind of lay, lay person observer might be able to distinguish a true story from a false one. There's a story that has to do, um, maybe you look up in the text and you can read the exact passages. I don't obviously have it in front of me, but the, these stories that are about um, a cloth being someone putting a cloth over somebody else's face. There are these couple stories that are really going the rounds in a lot of different versions. And it's the fact of there being so many different versions that is the the central clue to HF that these are not true stories because he hears these stories and they always have the same two distinguishing details inside of the story. Only in one case, it's supposed to have happened in West London and another case in South London and so forth. So uh, one of the appealing facts about this narrator, and it's clearly kind of intellectually allied with his ability to see that the bills of mortality will be one thing he can incorporate to tell his story, is that he's also offering a sort of tools of evaluation for the reader who wants to be well-informed and wants to be able to make good decisions based on the information that's out there. And it allows us to read the book and sort of take all of his stories and these many anecdotes. And he sort of, he has this strange duality in him. He's saying, I'm going to be quarantined. I should take care of myself. I'm going to lock myself in. And then he says, and then my curiosity won the exactly. battle. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what I mean about the character really isn't represented as a sort of more moral exemplar. Right. He's a curious intelligence in a body that needs to be out there, you know, and he really observes the most extraordinary things. I think that the the extended description of the mass graves is one of the most shocking parts of the entire book. Yeah, so can he goes there and they're they're burying people at night because they want to keep the public generally working. And he says, remarkably, actually, the markets kept on operating, people had food, they kept the prices, Mm -hmm. they didn't allow people to gouge people. But he goes to this mass grave and he watches and he gets in because he knows the section of the church and he can watch what they're doing to these bodies, which is so shocking and disturbing. And he's very shocked. And in some ways, I was interested to ask you, why does he go do this? Because he knows so many people are dying. But now we have the numbers. There are 4,000 and 8,000, 12,000 people, so many people. But he wants to see something for himself. Well, honestly, I think both Defoe, the writer, and H.F., the character who narrates this book, have the true journalist's heart, the okay. sense that it's it's more than just curiosity. It's a form of curiosity in which one's witnessing matters, 
right? Mm -hmm. So that uh, what HF is able to, to tell us because he can take, because he's taken that personal risk, it's, it would be simplistic to say that it's a sort of simple moral desire to help. It's certainly not primarily that, but mm -hmm. that the, you, there's a strong feeling at many points throughout this book that, that we're, we're, we're in the presence of an act of witnessing. It's interesting. And what you said, he's putting himself at personal risk because he's getting close to this grave. At this point, there, there's a fear of contagion from anybody who's infected. So this act of witnessing, I think, is, makes the book into something more than just a document about the plague. That's why we read it today, because there were many, many things yes. published at the time, right? There were countless books like that. Yes, it's that th the writing in that stretch is really it. It kind of catches you short and puts you in a position where you're really face to face with the brutality of human life and human existence and so forth. So that I think is really powerful. And that also just after that comes one of my other favorite passages in the book and one that I make a big deal about when I'm teaching it. You probably noticed it as you were reading because you're a literature professor, but it's the only place in the whole text where the continuity of the first person narrative subjectivity breaks. And in the middle of this otherwise completely consistent, coherent, you know, HF is narrating things in the 1660s, we get this sentence or two that says, NB, nota bene, this graveyard is still here in the year 1721, whichever year it is. So, you know, the kind of things I talk about with my students uh, concerning that moment, you know, we're, we're interested in the question of what, why is it worth it here for Defoe, the author, to break out of character and mm -hmm. give us that piece of present day witnessing or document or, or to indulge the present day documentary impulse? What is it about the author's project that, that makes the sacrifice of narr narrative integrity seem like not a big deal in the face of the desire to murk? And you now reading this book can go and see this very same place. Right. And so you think, what do you think is the intention here to make the reader feel this reality is still with you and you can verify this? I think so. So as to say, if you are reading it as if you were reading a horror novel by Stephen King and saying, oh, you know, this, I, you know, this is a dramatic story, but I'm very distant from it. Nothing like this is ever going to happen to us. He's bringing it home to us again by pointing out that it, this is the spot. So immediacy uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and making the story feel not just alive, but relevant, highly right. relevant to present day existence is and, part of the motivation for sure. And I want to ask you something else about when you said in the cemetery scene or this burial pit, it's not really a cemetery, even overflowing mass grave. He brings this kind of brutality into our vision. And there's many scenes where he sees people who are throwing themselves out of windows or who have to abandon their own family or who are actually just in despair dying of this terrible thing. What is it about the human need to actually make this real? Because you said the other part is these more builds of mortality. There are many numbers. So the, the realness, in a weird way, we push that away. We keep on saying, well, this is a terrible thing, but I don't want to know how real this really is. I mean, you could think of it as having another kind of literary precedent as well in the sense of Cassandra, the character of Cassandra as she's developed, you know, in, in those ancient Greek stories that cluster around the Iliad, which is to say the idea that somebody uh, is a is a is a prophet can see the future more clearly than others but has the curse of not being listened to that you know there's something really appealing to us very fundamental to uh, the way that art represents human nature and you could think of epidemiologists or proto-epidemiologists like HF uh, being structurally in that position with regard to the um, the public that they're trying to protect so Cassandra, tell us. So she is the woman who knows that some doom will befall the pop, the, 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 the her community, and people think she's stark raving mad and dismiss exactly, her. Exactly, exactly. They and don't so, believe her. It all ends terribly, and it's a. It's actually in that case a very clear instance of the ways that knowing more than other people know may not be advantageous. And it's 
it's a terrible figure because we had the doctor in China who actually went public and was actually shut down by the government and then who then died and actually is a terrible case who actually really wanted to warn other people and put himself at tremendous risk. I think that's the other part that he's going to this in the in the in the Defoe, he's going to this mass pit putting himself at risk for the sake of actually understanding this is really real. This is not just rumors. This is not people talking. There's not a bunch of numbers. I need to see it with my own eyes to then be able to convey to others. That's right. And it's, there are other scenes throughout the book when he walks through the town and he hears people suffering. He gives you these stories and sometimes he says, I don't know what else to add. What else can I say to this tremendous a horrible thing that's engulfed my city that I love so much and there's a kind of real deep love for London. And he says, there are abandoned streets and then there's scenes of suffering. What else can I do to convey to you how terrible this was? And he's, he's bumping right up against the edge of what language is able to do, but he is pushing pretty hard on that edge at all of those times. And this is actually interesting. Do you think in the last 300 years we have language has advanced or are there ways in which we've, is there something in human experience and existence that only fiction can sort of signal that and say, this is something we probably can't even quite express, but fiction can get you so close to it. Um, It's certainly for, for many, you know, readers and viewers, and we should be thinking about film and television as well as, you know, fiction on the page or those things and so forth. Certainly for many people, uh, it might be an artistic representation. Think of the AIDS crisis and think of something like, and the, and the band played on. It often does take a cogent literary or filmic representation of a widespread, political or public health issue and so forth in order to convey to larger numbers of people the force of what insiders pretty certainly already know but may really not have been able to transmit to larger circles. And the insiders in a crisis, why do you think people don't just listen to an eyewitness account? Why do we, why do we then have to resort to fiction or the imagination or something to actually convey which thousands of people said, just ask me and I can tell you what happened. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it will sound a bit pessimistic about human nature, but this current uh, pandemic is a very clear example. We've been hearing Cassandra-like warnings really since the end of December, even. <laughs> certainly very, very cl- clearly and widely accessible by the, you know, January 20th or something like that. I didn't look up the dates, but along those lines. And our attachment to our daily routines, our psychological need to feel safe and to feel as if life is continuing as usual makes it very, very hard at every level, I think, for people to, um, to, to listen to those in a way that would make them actually take action, so to speak. So we're all, I think, rightly just furious about the fact that the, the the warning that China gave the rest of the world was so just shabbily uh, ignored, not acted on in the United States, let's say. But that said, you know, it's very, very hard to persuade people that they need to make significant changes in their day-to-day behavior on the basis of something that's still essentially invisible. And, you know, the even encountering several eyewitness testimonies and so forth, it's still very, very easy just to keep on going about your everyday life. So I, when I think about uh, what hasn't happened over the past couple months, uh, so, some of the some of the inability to take action, you know, we can blame on specific political agendas and so forth. But a lot of it is really just the fact that the epidemiologists who understand what's happening and are trying to make those warnings are in a Cassandra-like position. There is a lot of incentive to not believe them or to or to believe them, but to sort of cordon that knowledge off in a way that doesn't lead to action, rather than to really make the kinds of enormous commitments of resources and sacrifices that that would have been required to take action sooner. 
I think it's interesting when you're saying it takes a lot to acknowledge that we have to shift our ways. And the, the strange parallel is I did a podcast on climate change a couple of months ago with a philosopher who said we need some storytelling capacity. And secondly, he said his name is Dale Jameson, and he said our morality doesn't really address what's happening with climate change because we really don't have a sense of responsibility for four generations hence. But to go back to this, we don't want to change our own ways. And what Defoe is saying, it's not because we are terrible people and we want to make money and profiteer. We want to deny other people their right to live. But for us ourselves, our, our lives are not just bare existence, but actually the routines, the people we spend time with, what we do every day. And I think that part of the book is really powerful that he says what broke away is the way we live our lives in this mm -hmm. big, messy city of London. And he said, there's a there's a deep kind of mourning for daily life as what it should be, which is complicated, not always positive, but full of vitality. Yeah, yeah agreed. And, and so when you, when you think about why we read fiction, and I'm really interested because you're such an avid reader, Jenny. You're, oh, yeah. You're actually one of the great readers. of. And I was quite interested in reading style in your book where you talk about that you appreciate, um, you said you read for a good sentence and you also read for the heart. I like this phrase. Um, why do we read books? And in this time right now, when a lot of people are going to be spending weeks and actually months shut in, actually very afraid, they're going to start getting very afraid because everyone is going to know somebody who is directly affected. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact that the economy is in free fall and we don't mm -hmm. exactly, and this is an event that is global, possibly for the first time. 9-11 was a specific yes. event. This is yes. something, so how, why do we turn to books? What do they do? Because I actually, I'm quite interested what you think, what do you get out of reading? I mean, I think there are two different main things. And the first one, I have to say, it's, it's not high-minded at all. It's pure escapism. Yes. For me, since I was a tiny child, opening the first page of a book and beginning to read. And really, I'm talking about novels here in particular, right. although riveting narrative nonfiction can serve the same purpose. Right. But there is just something truly extraordinary about the way that those words on the page, once you are an adept reader, it's not the case if you're a beginning reader or if reading hasn't gotten to the stage of being genuinely fluent. But when you are a fluent reader, it this this magic of printed letters on a page that translate into words in the mind and then into some kind of images or, or, or a less strictly verbal, you know, set of things going on. It's a, that act of immersing oneself in a world that is not one's own is just incredibly enjoyable, obviously more enjoyable to me than to some other people. <laughs> but and I like me, the for, fact that you... Like, yeah, so ahead, but, and the, the, the thing I like about the word immersion is like, it really is like diving into water, you know, and I do love swimming as well. And I do cherish that particular feeling that comes when you're underwater. Um, right. You're just in a very different environment. Your body has different properties than it does when you're above water. All of the sensations inside and outside the body are so different. So just that, just the, the, the tactile experience of entering into the thing that one is reading. And really it can be for intellectual prose as well. You know, something really electrifyingly good that you're reading. But I, I like the, the character in Heredity. When she gets on a plane, she reads Jurassic Park and has a, a, a couple a scotch or something on the plane. That's the beginning of one of your novels. That's, a, that's certainly, I don't know if I ever actually read that book on a plane, but that, that would uh, be a good piece of evidence for the idea that that novel is strongly <laughs> autobiographical. <laughs> <laughs> to tell you that this is funny because the book is also about heredity and kind of cloning and the possibility of recreating a life from someone who's deceased. That's part of the plot of the book. I read Jurassic Park on a plane when I flew to a job interview. And then uh, at the end of the job interview, someone said, what's the last book you read? <laughs> and I foolishly thought I should answer truthfully. And I said, oh, uh, Jurassic Park. And they said, what is that? And I said, oh, it's Michael Crichton. It was made into a big movie and it fell dead in the conversation. And I realized this was the worst possible answer for applying for a job in literature. 
I'm laughing as I say this, but maybe you are interviewing in a complex department rather than an English department, because I feel that actually in English departments in the U.S., the pleasures of light reading are well established, and you would have been more likely to think that that was tactically wise, because it shows that you're not a sort of intellectually elitist, oh, super that's funny. high brow, you know? Yeah, I was applying for super intellectual elitism. Yeah, and I, no, I know. <laughs> and I confess that actually I love reading, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, but maybe, but maybe since those days, you know, we're what we're both like 20, 25 years even into right. our careers as, as right. faculty members. Maybe these days people are a little bit more unabashed about their their low and middle brow pleasures than they I'm were. I'm quite then. proud that I've just reissued editions of Khalil Gibran, The Prophet, and Jack London's Call of the Wild, <laughs> which has been met with the same kind of contemptuous silence by some of my colleagues because they said, why would people read these books? And I thought, because those are the books that shaped us, many of you us know, as children also. This is actually the perfect opportunity for, for me to tell you a story about something that was has really been an edifying experience for me. So when I was a young assistant professor at Columbia, I was very, very broke, very underpaid, you know, still paying off credit card from grad school. So any opportunity to make any money was to be seized upon. My colleague, George Stade, now deceased, had taken on a massive project of being the general editor of the Barnes and Noble series of literary classics. So if you look at who edited those and wrote the introductions, they're disproportionately like then Columbia PhD students and young faculty. He was paying $1,000, which even at the time wasn't that much money. And I had a funny wrangle with him. He wanted me to do Tom Jones. And I just had to say, for $1,000, I'm going to write footnotes, you know, an annotation on Tom Jones. Are you crazy? Give me something short. So <laughs> the book that he gave me that I was really excited about, because as you're saying about Call of the Wild, it was a sort of childhood love of mine, was the uh, collected selected stories of Robert Louis Stevenson. It oh, was yeah. a little book that had Jekyll and Hyde and a handful of other stories chosen by me. I wrote an introduction. It really, although I love the books and I'm always happy to write an introduction to something, it really felt like something that I was doing for money. And as you know, at a place like Columbia, that sort of work just doesn't count at all as in terms of tenure or your research record. Like nobody cares. Like it's, it's a nothing. However, even to this day, I still get emails from random readers readers who have picked up my little cheapo Barnes and Noble edition of Jekyll and Hyde and read my introduction and were moved and illuminated by it and are writing to thank me for what I did there. It were another rather extraordinary example, although now that I think of it, I don't think I ever did get back to him, but I got an email from uh, a, a professor in South Africa who worked uh, in higher ed and was essentially making decisions about what the curriculum was going to be for the like final year in English literature students in high school was right. saying, what, what do you think? Do you think that Jekyll and Hyde does make sense to teach yeah. now? Or do you think it's too Anglo and white? you know, to 19th century and so forth. And so it, it was really, it was, a, it, it's a cliche to say this, but it was humbling to realize that this thing that I'd thought of as really quite minor could in certain respects be said to be one of the best things that I've ever published in terms of actually being in readers' hands and helping them understand these stories that I think you know, whether or not they're suitable for the South African high school curriculum is a separate question. But certainly for anyone who loves reading, those stories are just one of the great pleasures. Well, it's interesting. I want to go back to one thing. I think what you really pointed out nicely, that escapism doesn't mean we escape from the world. And that's why I introduced you also. You're a super athlete. You're not running away from the world, but it's a way of being immersed in something else and in someone else's imaginary world, which is a real pleasure to actually also surrender to someone else's imagining. And and I want to go back to sort of the introduction of these books, because I do think it is very important because this is the high school students and college students who are going to be the only ones who can do anything good about the planet, I feel. But to Mm -hmm. go back to the, the plague years, I also felt when reading it, it allowed me to process or to observe my own emotional responses to the scenes in the book, which I can't really gauge right now when I'm watching the news or reading any newspaper from around the world, it is so overwhelming and kind of paralyzing. But reading Defoe allowed me to think, 
oh my God, this is what these people are going through. They're losing their homes. They're being shut in. Their family members are quarantined. They cannot say goodbye to their people. They're not allowed to bury anybody. All these daily things that fell away from people. But my own responses became sort of visible to me because it's a book. I think that that's right. And, you know, I, I'm, I love the internet. I'm a person of the internet. Like I have thrived with the possibilities for online connection. I'm a true introvert stay at home person who's very happy to be having all of my social contact like this or, right. you know, by liking people's things on Facebook. Uh, but the fact is that the state, the mental state that we're in when we're hopping around between tabs and we're liking on Facebook and we're retweeting and so forth, it's a very, you know, it, it has it has its rewards. It's the constant little dopamine hits and so forth. Uh, but it's a very jittery, anxious state when it's intense in the ways that things are mm-hmm. now, right? It physiologically sort of revs you up. So one of the thing that books or really, you know, good quality television or film, anything, right. anything really, music, absolutely. Right. One of the things that those works of art can do for us, just as exercise can do this for us too, uh, whether it's yoga or running or playing basketball, whatever you do, don't play basketball right now though. Right. <laughs> but uh, whatever those things are, it gives you a space where your mind is quieted and calmed and put actually in a better position to really um, apprehend important realities, right? Rather than having the sort of sensation of something, you know, popping against like the, 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 the popcorn feel of being on Twitter or being on Facebook or even just of checking a bunch of different newspaper sites, you know, every five minutes. Right. That's certainly what my week has been like. You know, it's not that we shouldn't do any of that. I think I'm entitled to have a certain amount of loving like that. But I know that I will be a calmer and happier person better able to offer resources to myself and others if I have made that quiet space that also comes from having had a run and read a novel. And But say yeah. something about this, this state of mind you're in. So this book, the Defoe book, is about 200 pages. And there's something about knowing there's a 200-page book, which will take some of us as many hours as it takes, whatever. You're a very fast reader. Or some people are not as fast but you're going to go back into another world. And in some ways, I think it's a quiet mind, but it's not sedated or numbed or traumatized. There's That's something... right. It's, it, but, it's, but it's stimulating on a deeper level than yeah. these kind of tiny bits of stuff popping right. at you can really be. And I think this is actually what's, it doesn't make you into a better person. You're not going to walk away from the phone and say, no. oh, here's my instruction. But you have also in a strange way, rehearsed your own responses because you've seen people in the book and there's really only one character and then he observes all these other people. They said, wow, he had this response, he had this response. But it's one person's conversing with you or bringing you into their consciousness for a long time, which is very different from someone saying, I have this opinion here, Jenny, I saw this, share this, look at this, look at this. So this state of mind that is both quieter but deeper which it's a it's it's a very attractive state to be in and it certainly makes me and I'm certain many others just feel you know better equipped for life in general right. for the harder parts of life where you're not in that quiet reserve can, can we say about the something about the ending of the book there's another note of in it and NB which is very odd in the book <laughs> what happens to the character so what happens to him so he ends it on a little ditty that he lives and survives but what really happens to him it's, you know, I, it, I, I basically, when I'm laughing as I say this, but you, something that I say that's a bit scandalous to my 18th century fiction students is that you really don't have to have read the whole book in order to get the point of it. And I don't think that that's true of the great British 19th century novels. You do need to have read the whole of Middlemarch in order to get the point of Middlemarch, right? Yeah. But yeah. these 18th century novels, uh, books like Journal of the Plague Year, or Richardson's Pamela, or Stern's Tristram Shandy, and so forth. To some extent, you really can get the point of the book by just reading a chunk of it. So as a practical matter, although I, of course, have read the whole book through many times, when I, uh, when I give instructions to my students 
for reading something like this, I give them really clear priorities. Like we're going to discuss the first half of the book Mm -hmm. much, much more closely than we're going to discuss the second half of the book. And if there are specific page ranges in that second half that I really am likely to talk about in class, I'll tell you that in advance so that if you're pressed for time, you can be selective about what you're going to read. Just in case anyone is thinking that they're going to pick up Journal of the Plague Year and it will be as riveting as a novel like Jurassic Park. Well, it is riveting and it is a page turner, but it doesn't have the shape and structure that kind of captures you and makes you have to keep on reading until you see what happens in the end. It's kind of an intense experiential novel that produces strong feelings, but you kind of could just take 10 pages of it and right. use that to, to get the same benefits in terms of running intellectual and emotional scenarios about some of these things. There are two episodes I just wanted to touch upon before we close. There's one where he meets these three brothers, the joiner, the soldier, and the baker. So they are three brothers and they're trying to think, okay, we got to get out of here. Um, we don't really have a lot of means. We're kind of independent. And one is uh, probably has a war injury or something. And they sort of say, we're going to band together and get out. And then this whole, and he keeps on announcing the story. It's like a teaser. He says, I'm going to get to the story. And then he doesn't get to the story. And then he said, I'm going to tell you the story about the three brothers. And you get really excited. And the story is really amazing. They go out and they try to get out of London, basically. And then they come upon a band of other people and they say, they check each other out and they say, okay, we don't have the plague. You don't have the plague. Okay, we can sort of be together for a bit. And then they set up this camp outside of a little town and the town says don't come near us you probably bring the plague you're coming from london which is literally sort of what happens right now is like you probably infected don't come close and then they stage this whole theater basically and with fire and shadows and some tent they pretend they have a lot of soldiers they have almost nobody they have no weapons they make weapons out of wood and then the little town becomes really intimidated and said oh my god there's a gang of people from london they're going to overwhelm us So they negotiate on complete make-believe. And I love this part because it's sort of also the human imagination is still so powerful. So they pretend to the town that they have equipment and horses and guns and everything. And if they don't do what they do, and then the town says, okay, we'll give you money. We'll leave it here on this field. You can come get it at night. Do not endanger us. So this seems to be where Defoe really gets into the power of fiction to tell each other something. And it, you may not have read Robinson Crusoe in recent memory, in which case you probably won't remember this scene, but there's a closely analogous episode near the end of Crusoe as well, which is to say, once these uh, folks are, you know, actually arriving on Crusoe's island and he right. wants, you know, the mutineers are arriving on the island, Crusoe becomes a figure that language makes this uh, parallel clear, a figure a little bit like Prospero in The Tempest, somebody who can stage manage wild sounds and unsettling appearances and so forth in (laughs) order to terrify these encroachers and to give them the impression that there's actually possibly a supernatural force, but like a large, you know, other military force and so forth. So we think of Defoe as being this rather literal minded, somewhat unimaginable imaginative novelist but moments like that you really see him uh, going all in on the powers of imagination and another the another um question i have which is sort of asking an email sort of we all hope that something there must be something good that comes out of this it is very distressing for a lot of people a lot of people are really truly suffering already and we don't know what how to even console anybody but Defoe touches on this several times in the book, and he says, I'll read you one sentence. He says, here we may observe, and I hope it will not be amiss to take notice of it, that a near view of death would soon reconcile men of good principles one to another, and that it is chiefly owing to our easy situation in life and our putting these things far from us, that our breaches are fomented, ill blood continued, prejudices, breach of charity and of Christian union, so much kept and so far carried on among us as it is. Another plague year would reconcile all these differences. But then it doesn't really happen. We don't become oh, better people. Yeah, I, I hear that as a kind of hollow recitation of Protestant orthodoxy rather than something that either Defoe or his narrator really believes. So there's the hope that some calamity brought upon us will make us into better people and we will suddenly see what's important in life and what's not important. He does not, he don't think he really, he really doesn't, I really don't. I really have no reason to think that he believes that. And I think that really that the narrator, you, you, one of the other things that's so striking about the novel is that 
it, it is actually quite short for a novel by Defoe. And it really, it really does convey the sense, maybe in this case, I would invoke Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream of being a special contained period in which mm -hmm. everything changes, but will then revert to normal afterwards. Okay, so, like a like a different, like a totally alter, alternate reality for a yes, while. Yes, like an alternate reality that we that we can be slid into, and yeah. that we're in for a good protracted period, but that fundamentally intrinsically doesn't have those kinds of effects of transforming human nature. So it's a it's an ideal that can be expressed, but it's it's wishful to think that it could be the case because really the whole point is that human behavior is such that we will fall back into our old habits after this period of a state of emergency in which we all come together and put aside differences and so forth. And there's an, also a terrible historical irony he keeps on alluding to in the book and the great fire of London comes a year later and ravages all of London. So they survived the plague, people come back into town he has very moving scenes of people suddenly being able to converse and being excited. They're making a bit of a mistake. Some of them still get sick. And then the fire comes a year later. If it were, you know, an epic multi-season television program, like the fire would be season two. <laughs> that's, that's right. And we would all turn it off because it's so, this is also, Too I think, much. <laughs> yeah. well, this goes back to the Cassandra theme. Like and I wrote a dystopian novel a few years ago where Australia is ravaged by wildfires. A cruise ship is sunk off the coast of Miami and my narrator is in a quarantine unit because some undiagnosed illness. But the book was really sort of a, I didn't go further than that because nothing was believable. So this, what you touched upon earlier, a, a survivor, a witness is either a prophet or a stark raving madman or mad woman. Yeah. That fiction has to navigate the space between this is exaggerated and you're going to turn off the television program second season because it's too much. Now there's a fire after the plague, come on. What we're living through right now is this kind of, incredulity the world is falling apart on so many levels how can this be real and the newspaper today looks like the newspaper i would have made up four years ago or anybody yes. would have some dystopian person to go back to sort of this question from defoe so when you stop reading a book when you stop reading a book and you read a lot of novels what's your feeling after that do you feel oh you're a little sad you left it you're, you're leaving this world or <laughs> i'm so sad and i'm especially sad when it's a new novel that i've been waiting for and i read it too quickly and it's done and it's really physically painful, like, oh no, it's going to be a whole nother year before I get to spend more time with the next installment of these characters. So serious fiction especially has that pleasure, but, you know, other other kinds of self-contained fiction can absolutely have it too. And I'm, I'm a pretty big rereader. I think that rereading books that we love is also one of the great reading pleasures. And certainly for me, I mean, it good new stuff that I haven't read before that's really fun and escapist is going to be high up on my uh, reading priorities this month and next month. But there certainly are also favorite books of childhood or of earlier periods in my life that I'm planning to revisit. So when you reread something that you loved as a child, how do you feel about yourself? Do you see yourself and you see your, your, yourself as an eight-year-old or 10-year-old? Mm -hmm. I don't know that that's exactly it. I feel that there's a deep continuity in my reading self from yeah. as early as I can imagine. And of course, sometimes the books that we loved when we were children really don't live up to adult scrutiny. For instance, I loved the books of Madeline Lengel when I was, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11. Right. And they're really kind of awful now that I read them as an adult. I know that people will disagree with me and that she has many diehard fans, but there's a kind of self-indulgence and smugness that's very, very unattractive and that it, it makes them no longer pleasurable for me to read because I can see that quality so strongly. On the other hand, there are many other books that are still equally delightful. Right. When you think about, you said earlier, if you're not a fluent reader yet, there are a lot of people right now who have a lot of time on their hands because they have very different professions from us. They actually are very engaged every day. There's a lot of things that happen and suddenly people are really alone in a way and don't know what to make of solitude. What do you think would be a step into reading, if you're not used to reading novels the way you are, sort of what do you think you would start with? Go back to childhood favorites or find an, a thrilling adventure novel or what do you think would be a way to start? 
I have to say that I do think that either rereading a childhood favorite or going to the most obvious popular fiction, you know, there's a reason that these books are so popular. Lee Child's Jack Reacher books are brilliant. Yes, yeah. they're somewhat uneven, but you can read them in any order because they don't proceed sort of start to finish. Uh, the best six or seven of those are just exceptional. The, are the Harry Potter books perfect? No. And I personally would recommend Diana Wynne Jones's Crestomancy Chronicles instead. <laughs> However, if you read the Harry Potter books at a younger stage of life and you know them and they're reassuring, that's another great kind of thing to read. So uh, some of these popular storytellers are just very, very skilled at making the world immediately immersive and at, mm -hmm. at holding you in it. And I do think that that kind of book for people who don't usually read a novel would be the right kind of book to, to look for now. The two things I really going to remember from this interview among the default things what you said that it's a it's a um a quieter state of mind but a deeper state of mind and then the other thing is when you enter into a novel this immersion that you actually are given time so harry potter and these books are structured in these really amazing ways that they they already kind of they keep on making you move ahead and they say this is going to happen they give away a lot actually much more than one would think stephen king for example which i read for a while it gives away almost everything on the first page always, and then it unfolds, how do we get there? So it gives you time because you want to now get somewhere versus yeah. this time right now where the news are just overwhelming, but you would have, there's, no, there's nothing to look forward to right now. Because and there's no shape to the experience and because of the internet, we're not, just, we're not waiting to go and pick up a print newspaper. We're, we're kind of able to get bits of it at any time of day or night and so forth. And, all just the the process of being in you know the the process of consuming things in that way is rather destabilizing to peace of mind so finding these places where where we experience a radical alteration of our relationship to time can be very very powerful in terms of changing how we feel yeah i think that's a that's a real um important thing for people that teaching uh, reading doesn't make you a better person reading may no. not teach you anything you may not learn a thing, but you will have been with yourself in time in a deeper way. Yes. And that will be more true. You know, I see there's a reading group online that Yi and Lee is directing with a, a War and Peace reread. And that's actually a wonderful immersive novel as well. So for more experienced readers who do often read novels and from older time periods, not just contemporary, the 19th century novels are extraordinary in this regard. You know, David Copperfield would be another one that I would recommend or someone who wants to go into a rich and fascinating place and be in it for a long time, yeah. be able to be in it for as long a short a time as you want to put it away and to have it still be there for you to come back to. That is just extraordinary. And do you read um, on uh, electronic devices or do you read physical copies of books? I, in, anything that's for work, I still read on paper. And if I'm reading nonfiction for work or otherwise, if it's the kind of book where I would want to use the index at all, I'll still have a paper book. But I actually started reading, I, I, I held out against switching over to a Kindle for a long time. But in 2010, I spent six months living with my partner in, who lives in Grand Cayman. He's Canadian, but he lives and works in the Cayman Islands. Uh, I'd sublet my apartment here. I was there. And I basically found myself in the situation of needing a very large quantity of books and not being able to get them from either the public library or the Columbia library, not being able to buy used mass market paperbacks from the guy who sells books on a table in front of Milano market and so forth. Uh, and there is a very good bookstore in Cayman, a branch of the books and books that, uh, that comes out of Miami, but uh, books in Cayman are essentially, you're, pay, you're paying not just the full cover price in American dollars, you're paying about 20% more than that because at Books and Books, there's the hard cover, it's $24.95 and you pay $24.95 in CI dollars, which is more like $31 right. or something like right. that. So I realized that as someone who, when I'm on sabbatical, would pretty likely be reading at least one novel a day and would certainly have days where I wanted to read more than one novel, that this was going to be a financial catastrophe. Right. So I gave in and I ordered a Kindle. And really since then, most of the, um, most of the reading that I do for fun, I mm -hmm. do on a Kindle. I unscrupulously spend, it's, it, I, I, I describe it 
uh, somewhat self-mockingly as my major form of self-care, that to have an infinite variety of fiction available to me, you know, right. at, at right. any time is incredibly comforting to me. And it's the probably one of the main things that I spend discretionary income on. So right. I get everything I want on my Kindle. I don't worry about requesting it from the public library and being like number 60 on the wait list or whatever. And it really is convenient if you're a person who travels a lot. I remember the old days, I would visit my grandparents in London and I would be coming back, you know, from Heathrow to Newark or whatever whatever it was. And I would basically go to the airport bookstore and buy four or five different novels. Or I'd be really happy if I found an epic fantasy novel or a Stephen King because they're like 900 pages. That's right. But, you know, these great police procedurals that we all love to read so much, they're often really only about 200 pages. I can read one probably in less than two hours if I'm on a plane and there's nothing else to do. So, you know, if, 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 for, the, for, the, uh, for the transatlantic flight, along with some waiting time and possible delays, like I needed a physically um, cumbersome amount of reading material. And then I also, of course, would need to get rid of the books afterwards. You know, if you read a lot like that, like it, every six months, you've basically got like a couple hundred books, uh, and, uh, most uh, of which you small. really don't need to keep. <laughs> so moving to uh, to a Kindle, was, w w w w although it comes with the cost that you can't just hand on a book you like to someone you know, et cetera. Right. I do still, I buy, I buy hardcovers, of, of new books that I know I'm going to be reading right. again, or that I know that I want to give to my mother or to somebody right. else, but mostly I'm reading on an electronic device. And the nice thing is in this period right now, a lot of the classics are actually available for free. I mean, they're good editions. Absolutely. You introduced some, I've introduced some, so it's useful to have those introductions, but there are also a lot of things published before 1925 that are available. Um, and so people want to delve into the classics yeah. Even even the first Agatha Christie's are now becoming available. So. Exactly, they're, they're, and, and you know, and, and writers like Stevenson are a really good example. They're all out right. there, and this can be, you know, in general, we don't like it when our students have rogue online editions because we want to be having them able to turn to the page that right. we're on and editions are different, but certainly one of the grad students in the class I'm teaching this semester on Richardson's Clarissa had really just left New York for a couple of days to visit family in Rhode Island and is now essentially right. stuck there, you know, not unpleasantly stuck there, but stuck right. there without right. any of her books or, or reading notes or anything like that. So the fact that we're reading Clarissa makes this much easier than it might be. Otherwise right. she was able to find a pretty good version for free on the internet and yeah. Download it. I think just onto her phone because you can have a Kindle app or reading. I have that. Yes, I read it on so my forth. phone. Um, yeah. So I think that the it, it's truly it's truly accessible. And, and if you don't have you know access to that kind of stuff, if you don't have a smartphone, for instance. The, there are physical copies of, of these books. As long as you're a little like, oh, I wanted to read War and Peace, but it looks like what they've got is Anna Karenina. I'll take that. You know, these right. books are just lying around for free places. Right. Like it's right. really something that you are able to get hold of. Uh, ask friends who read to like do a trade with you right. if you've got right. everything in the house. There are so many ways to get your hands on good books and they really don't have to cost a lot of money. Shani, I really appreciate you taking the time, and I'm quite happy that we went from, you know, Defoe, which everybody recommends right now to read. It's like, okay, read that, fine, and then actually start reading and start yes. reading with the kind of fluency and joy and pleasure that you actually sort of exemplify, which is really wonderful. It's not as <laughs> serious kind of, and I like this. <laughs> But actually, that's why we went into what we do. And that's why I do this podcast. Absolutely. I mean, we love the really analytic intellectual stuff. Yeah, but right. that I would love be literature, like, actually. That's yeah, what I, I went into. I always yeah. liked the, uh, and I always felt you, I never forgot why I loved stories yeah. and I loved language. And I love what you said earlier, how a sentence on the page can produce a world that is not entirely yours, but you are allowed to be in it. Yeah. Uh, so we're we're very very fortunate that we are making such comfortable livings doing yeah. this thing that we love so much and sharing it with students. It's tr I truly feel very very lucky. Yeah, we're going to try to find ways. This is why to disseminate this further, so people move on from Defoe to other books. They have done the right thing. <laughs> that sounds good. All right, yeah. thanks, Ollie. This is thank great. you, Jenny. Okay, uh -huh. thanks so much.